remember the special day where we prayed you in here and you came. We're glad that you're here today. We are in a sermon series called Heroes from Hebrews chapter 11. If you want to turn your Bible apps to Hebrews 11 and also from Genesis chapter 12 we'll be reading today. <clears throat> but let me just stop and say a few words about last Sunday. What a great Sunday it was to be able to share with you our 10-year plan for Lighthouse Church and to introduce to you for the first time the new facilities that we want to build. In fact, uh, do you guys, would you happen to have that slide up there if you, if you would? There you go. If you weren't here last week, uh, this is what uh, our plans are. You can see we're building a youth a youth and children's center and a multi-purpose gymnasium, kitchen, multi-purpose building, everything, putting elevators in, handicap accessible, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle is going to be awesome. And last week I shared with you that we were, you voted as a church to move forward with this project and to begin fundraising for it. So we began fundraising. I didn't even take up an offering last week, but I told you that we had $15,000 waiting that was pledged for matching and needed $15,000 to match it. So last Sunday, without me even asking you to give a penny, you gave $16,000. So now there is 31. <laughs> yeah. So we kicked off our building fund without taking an offering the first Sunday with $31,000. That's God, right? That's God. And, and if you want to give, now we have it now uh, this week. We put it on the website and all the platforms, just uh, the ARC project. Remember, we're building an ARC, building an ARC for our children, for their children, for the saving of our families for the future. So if you see that, the ARC project, that's the building fund. And I know you're going to want to give to that. Did you find Hebrews 11? Yes. Hebrews 11, verse 8. Let's stand together as we read. This will be on the screen if you don't have a Bible with you. We're reading from the New International Version. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed. And went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob. That's his son and his son grandson that are coming whom were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations. What city? Whose architect and builder is God. He's talking about the New Jerusalem, the heavenly city. All these people, what people? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, were still living by faith when they died. Get this. They did not receive the things promised. I said they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them in the spirit and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own, if they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. But instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God was not ashamed to be called their God. In other words, therefore, God was pleased with them for their faith. For he has prepared a city for them. Amen. You may be seated. We're talking this morning about a faith that goes. And we're talking about Abram, Abraham. In the text, he's called Abram in Genesis. That's his birth name. 
Later, God will change his name to Abraham. So I'll be referring to him as Abram, Abraham, Abram, Abraham. It's one and the same person as we go along today. So he is one of the key figures in the Bible. He is called the father of our faith, and we're going to see why today. So let me just tell you a little bit about Abraham. One of the most important people in all of history as recorded in the Bible. In fact, he's mentioned in 27 different books in the Bible for a total of 308 references, 236 in the Old Testament, 72 in the New Testament. And we are first introduced to Abraham in Genesis chapter 11. So let's go to Genesis chapter 11. And this is where we are first meet Abraham. We're laying a foundation. We'll be talking about Abraham and his wife Sarah the next two or three weeks. So it says, verse 27, 11, Hebrew, Genesis 11, verse 27. This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So Abram had two brothers, Nahor and Haran. Terah was his father. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. So we see here that Abram was born here with his brothers in a town called Ur of the Chaldeans. We, we do know where this town was. If you look in the back of your Bibles or in a, pull up a Bible map in your app, You'll see Ur down there. It's, uh, it's right by the Persian Gulf. In fact, most archaeologists believe that Ur was actually, although was actually on the Gulf, that the Persian Gulf extended and has receded since then, but extended, it was a Gulf city because their, the excavations of Ur showed it as a shipping and merchant town. It was a town that worshipped a pagan town that worshipped the moon god, and it was a heathen place. But it was, a, it was also a, a town of great intellect. When I say heathens, I don't mean like native, I mean like they were pagan, but they were very intellectual. In fact, uh, they discovered in one home a clay jar, and they, they found inside the jar uh, a tablet that somehow had survived because uh, it was it was uh, preserved in such a way that it could. And it had a equation for trigonometry. <laughs> Imagine that. So this is a long, long time before there was ever a math book, right? <laughs> uh, so that's where, that's where this whole story started. And it mentions Abram's brother Haran because uh, we see here that Haran died, and that he had a son. So let's read that. The name of Abram's wife, it says, uh, Abram and Nahor both married, and the name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Ishka. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive at least not at this time. When she's 80-some years old, God will miraculously enable her to conceive. <laughs> but this is, these little highlights are put in here because it's telling and it's, it's laying a foundation for a story that's going to be told. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. And it was there Terah lived 205 years and died in Haran. So let's talk about it. It mentions Abram here. Abram, his name means exalted father. Later... God is going to change Abram's name to Abraham, which means father of many. 
and that was a prophetic word and name that God gives Abram, turns his name to Abraham because he's, he promised Abraham that through his loins, through his flesh, would come many nations and peoples. And this was a prophecy given to Abram when he didn't have any children, when he was old and his wife was old and barren, and they, they're going to have lots of descendants. How is this going to be? And God even spoke it when he spoke his name. You're going to be Abraham from now on. And we know that through Abraham would come the descendants through Isaac that would be the Jewish race that would populate all over the earth and be God's chosen people. Also, through Ishmael, his firstborn son through Hagar would be the Arab nations. And you might be surprised to know that three of the major religions in the world look to Abraham as their spiritual father. Christians, of course, Jews, and Muslims. That's right. The Muslims believe that Abraham was their father of their faith as well. It's just that the story in the Quran is different than in the Bible. And if you read in the Quran, as I have, you discover in the story of Abraham's two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. And in the Bible, it says that God chose Isaac to be the son of promise, and he sent Ishmael away. Remember that story? Well, in the Quran, it's just the opposite. In the Quran, God chooses Ishmael as the son of promise, as the firstborn son, and Isaac is sent away, and he becomes the Jewish, the Semitic people. And there you have 4,000 years of conflict in the Middle East right there. <laughs> all explained, right? So a, an exact opposite view of who is God's chosen people. Islam says we are through Ishmael. Jews say we are through Isaac. Christians say we are through the lineage of Isaac, which would become Jesus Christ. So that's a little bit of history there. And here is Abram living in Ur when God speaks to him and tells him this. Abram, I want you to leave your, your roots, leave your city, leave your country. I want you to pack up bags, take your family, and I want you to move to a distant land. And here's the kicker. He says to him, I'm not going to tell you where you're going. I just want you to leave. <laughs> now, there's so much here that the text does not tell us, right? Why did God cho choose Abram? He obviously didn't just randomly pick somebody. Abram must have had uh, a relationship with God. He could hear and knew God's voice. This was passive, possibly passed on to him through his great, 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 great grandpa, Shem, through whom the lineage would come. In fact, the first part of chapter 11 shows the lineage of Shem, which would be, you know, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the three sons of Noah. And it's through Shem, the Shemites, that the Israelites, the Jewish people, would come, and through them the Messiah would come into the earth for the salvation of the whole world. The Bible gets us to this point in chapter 11 and then narrows in on Shem and his line through which is Abram. So he's from that righteous line and lineage, and we know that they began to call upon the name of the Lord through Seth. And this is the line of Seth, and now the line of Shem. Others suggest that maybe Abram was connected through the prophet Job, or some even believe he was connected to God through the king Melchizedek of Salem. But that was such a long distance away it could be, we just don't know. The text doesn't tell us. And we know that Abram was living in a pagan moon-worshipping city, as I said. And you've got to remember that even though Abram was living in this pagan place, he was a worshiper of Yahweh. 
like Daniel in our series, we can learn from Abram that even when it, nobody else around you believes, you can believe and serve the Lord. And he did so, and he worshiped him, and God picked him and chose him. Now remember, this is before there was any Bible, before there were any texts or manuscripts, before there was any churches or synagogues. This is way before any of this happened. God had a relationship with Abram. God's always wanted to have a relationship with us. Amen? Amen. And he could trust Abram to be faithful to the call. In fact, if you read in Genesis on the story in chapter 12 and 13 and 14 and on, in chapter 12 and verse 7, it says that God appeared to Abram in Haran and said, I want you to take your family and go to Canaan. This is the first time that he'll tell him where he's going. He's going to Canaan. But listen, it says God appeared to Abram. This is the first time in the Bible since the Garden of Eden when God left the garden that it says God appeared to somebody. He appeared to him in person and spoke to Abram. We don't know what that was like, some manifestation of God. Probably it was Jesus who appeared. It doesn't say that in the text. Probably it was Jesus, the mediator between God and man, who spoke to Abram, but he tells him, I want you to go to Canaan. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't a vision. It wasn't a voice. God came and spoke to Abram. This is how important this event is. I want you to see. God came down to the earth for the first time since the Garden of Eden and speaks to a man and says, you're the one. I'm choosing you and your family. This is big, right? And Abram is not perfect. In fact, None of these characters in Hebrews 11 are perfect. They all have flaws. And if you follow Abram's story, you'll see that he had some, even though he's the father of our faith, he had some lack of faith several times in his life. Made some big mistakes because he didn't have enough faith. But yet God honors him for what he does here and the faith that he has. And this is what makes him so great is that Abraham believed and trusted God for what God had promised, even though he never saw it come to pass. I wonder if you and I could do that. <laughs> if God had given you a promise of something and you never saw it, would you still serve him? Would you still love him? So he's a prime example of what faith is and definition, the definition of faith in verse 1. Things hoped for Things not seen. I mean, just think about this. Abraham lived his entire adult life after leaving Ur for things that he would never see. Experiences he would never have here on the earth. Nor his sons, nor his son's sons. In fact, God said, I'm going to give you Canaan, it's going to be the land for your inheritance. I'm giving you all this land, and your, 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 your descendants will be like the stars of the sky, so much that you won't be able to even count them. It was 585 years after Abraham died before they ever even took the promised land. So Abraham teaches us. Several things, and let's look at the first one. The first one is we can learn from Abraham about obedience. Obedience. As we just read, God speaks to Abraham and says, I want you to move to Canaan. And when he's in Ur, he says, I want you to go to a place I'm going to tell you. I'm not even going to tell you where you're going. I just want you to pack your bags and go. So let me ask you this question today. If God told you, to sell your house, put everything you had into a moving truck because he's relocating, relocating you, but he doesn't tell you where you're going. Would you do it? Personally, I would be like, okay, God, but you're going to have to give me some more information here. Is it a cold climate or a warm climate? Because I need to know what clothes to bring. 
should I bring my tools because they're really heavy, but, you know, I'm either going to be building a home myself or am I going to be buying an existing one? How many bedroom sets should I bring with me? Should I take all cash or leave some money in the account here? How much money, God, am I going to need for the trip? What do I tell everyone when they ask me where I'm going? Because I don't know. doesn't sound very good, especially to my in-laws. <laughs> How long is your journey? Do I need the kennel? For the dog, should we bring food or will we be eating out? I mean, God, you've got to give me something here. That will be me. I don't know what your response would be. That will be my response. I'll go, God, but you've got to give me some information. Could you imagine this? Abram was going without knowing, right? One preacher said, Abram, Abraham went on the march without a map. I like that. So notice two things about Abraham's response when God said, I want you to do this. The first thing is that it was immediate. It was immediate. There was no hesitation on his part. There was no questioning. He just up and left. He trusted God. He believed God that God was going to take care of him. And he lived his life that way. You know, this is really what God ultimately wants for all of us. And this is a, Abraham is a challenging subject to teach about because Abraham t challenges us because a lot of us, most of us, myself included, I know you don't want to hear that as your pastor, but myself included, like we trust God to such a point, but then to jump off, right, into the unknown is scary. And we often hesitate because there's no safety net. There's no safety rope. It's like, I'm going to step out. And sometimes God takes us there. Sometimes he, he ties a rope around us and says, okay, go. And we go because we know he's got the rope. But sometimes he lets go of the rope and says, I said, go. But God, just go. Trust me. Trust me. And that's what happened to Abram. And Abram did it. But, you know, I can so relate to this call. When he got the call from God in his life, I remember when God called me to preach. And he spoke to me and we wrestled. And you've heard that story for 45 minutes. I said no, no, no to God. And when I said yes to God, this peace and this joy and this passion came over me that I, what I did that night was I took and I gave, it's like if I had all of my money in my, for my whole life in one, in one account, and I took that debit card, and I gave it to God, and I gave him the pin, and I said, here's my life, God. Every day of my life is on this bank card. Every day of my life is here. I give you the card and the pin, not knowing when God was going to do what with my life, where he was going to take me, what I was going to do. I didn't know, and I didn't care, because I knew that God wanted me and he had a plan for my life and I knew that God was a good God amen, amen. and so I just easily I just easily gave God the debit card to my life and when I did everything changed it's kind of like uh, when I got married I was thinking about this this morning I was asking my wife about it because it's been 30 in August to be 39 years and I was thinking back at the marriage vows that she wrote and she read to me, and it was either in that, and she couldn't remember either. <laughs> it was either in, the, in, the, in what she wrote or in the ceremony for the pastor, I remember were the words from the book of Ruth, where Ruth tells Naomi, where you go, I will go, and your God will be my God. Linda said that to me when she got married to me, right? She said, where you, where you go, Lane, I will go. Your home will be my home. I'm not marrying your career. I'm not marrying your job, right? I'm marrying you. One of the best things my wife ever said to, the, to me is, I'm not marrying Pastor Lane. I'm marrying Lane the person. Not Lane the pastor, Lane the person. I'm with you. We are one. And that's what God wants. God wants us, first of all, to be united to him. He wants us to say, okay, where you go, where you send me, God, is inconsequential. I just want to know that you are with me. 
Obedience is an act of trust and faith, and this comes out of relationship. Abram had a relationship with God. There was no religion at the time. There was no law. This was before Moses ever came. God has always desired this relationship with us, and that's what faith is, trusting God with your life. All of it. He wants you to put yourself in the offering basket. He wants you to offer your body as a living sacrifice to him. He wants all of you and all that you have. And that takes a lot of trust and a lot of faith. But God has already proven his love for you. He died on a cross for you. God has already proven his provision for you because he created everything in the universe. God has already showed you how important you are because you are fearfully and wonderfully made in his image and every day of your life is written in his book. People say, well, you know, when I'm talking to people who don't believe in God, and maybe there's somebody here this morning, you're struggling with faith in God. And maybe you've been taught at your school or university that, you know, we shouldn't live by faith. We should only live by reason. That we should live by facts and not by faith. And that religion or serving God or being a Christian is all about faith. And we should live by faith because you can't prove God and you can't prove anything. We should never live by faith. We should only live by reason. And if that's you and you're listening online or you're here in the room today, I just want to say to you that that's unreasonable. (laughs) You'll get that in a second. (laughs) Because the fact is that every person every day lives by faith in all kind of things, right? When you came in to the sanctuary today and you sat in that chair I bet you didn't check the chair and pull it out and make sure it was strong enough to hold you and make sure it wasn't broken. No, you just sat down in that chair. You had faith. You didn't know. You just trusted by faith that that chair was going to hold you, right? You had faith that this morning when your wife brought you the cup of coffee that there wasn't poison in it. She may have been thinking about it, but she didn't do it. (laughs) But you had faith. You drank that coffee. You drive down the road. I was driving down the road the other day, and all of a sudden, this driver was distracted by his phone, obviously. He was like this. And he starts veering over into my lane. And I'm like, you know, and I gave him, no, I didn't. (laughs) But I was like, Scared like, whoa, swerve out of the way. And I thought, you know, we live every day by faith just driving down the road. If you're on a two-lane road, you're trusting that every single car that comes this way is going to stay in their lane. You're living by faith at any second, bam, just like that. You could be dead, you could be out, right? No, you you live by faith or you would never drive on a two-lane highway. You live by faith that the bank is going to pay the bill when you use your debit card and swipe it. You just trust in your bank that they're going to transfer that money into their account. Many of the things we do every day require faith to do them. So this is why it's not irrational to have faith in Jesus Christ. If you will just take the same kind of faith that you put in everything every day and put that faith in Jesus, you will discover that Jesus Christ is who he said he is, that he is real, that he is alive, that he is risen from the dead, and that he will give you eternal life. Hallelujah. We only have to look around us to see that there is a God. It's revealed in creation around us. And we only have to look within us to see that God is real and believe in him because he's put in us a conscience. He's put in us a measure of faith to believe. There is evidence all around you, my friend, that God is real. Just look around you. At the people, look at the buildings, look at the science, look at the creation, and you'll see that this was designed by 
chance? No, this was a divine design. Things didn't just happen with a big bang. It takes a lot more faith to believe in some theory that there was a big bang and all of a sudden there were hummingbirds and bumblebees, right? That, that takes a lot more faith to believe that I was once a monkey when there's no transition, right? So it takes a lot more faith to believe that than to, to look around and say, it's obvious that God exists. Look at this planet. It's obvious that God exists. Look at the morality that he's put within those who don't even believe him or know him. Amen? If God is real and he is, if Jesus really rose from the dead and ascended and is coming back and he is, then this changes everything about how we should live and who we should live for. So Abraham believed. It was credited to him as righteousness. And he did what? He moved. Abraham moved. God said go and he went. He trusted him. He believed in God. So Second thing is, it was immense. It was immense. Not only was it immediate, his response was immense. He was not only, listen, Abraham was not only changing his location. He was changing his whole lifestyle. Abraham went from living in a home in one location to becoming nomadic and living in a tent for the rest of his life on earth. You may ask, how could Abram do such an immense task so easily? Abraham could do this so easily. Because even though Abraham didn't know where he was going, he knew with whom he was going. Amen? And that's all that any of us need to know, that God is with us. Abraham's motto must have been this. If God is there, that's where I'm going. That's where I want to be. Where are you going, Abram? I don't know, but God is going with me, and that's all that matters. Where he goes, I go. And that should be the motto for all of us, right? We should wake up every morning and say, okay, God, where do you want me to go today? This is a journey we're taking together. I'm following you, and where you lead me, I will follow. This is what the children of Israel learned as they went through the desert on the way to the promised land. Just like Abram, they followed the presence of God. There was a visible pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. And the Bible says that when the cloud stopped, they stopped. And they set up camp and they stayed there. And when the cloud moved, they moved. When the fire moved, they moved. They wanted to be in the presence of God. Why? Because they understood that God was their provider, God was their protector, and God was their director. And without God, they were just going to die in the desert. They had put their whole trust in him, and wherever God is, there is provision, there is protection, there is direction. That's good preaching, Pastor. Things have not changed. Beloved, now, John said, we are the sons and daughters of God. And God is our provider. Amen? For my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God is our protector. What does it say in Psalms 91? It says this. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow. There's that cloud in the desert, right, of the Almighty. I will say of God the Lord, you are my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely God will deliver me from the snare of the fowler, from the noise of pestilence. He shall cover me with his feathers and under his wings. Hallelujah. I will find refuge. I will not be afraid, the psalmist said, for the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that walks at noonday. A thousand will fall at my side, ten thousand at my right hand side. 
but it will not touch me. I will only see from a distance the hand of the Lord. Even the Most High, I have made him my habitation, and therefore there will no evil befall me, neither plague come nigh my dwelling, for he shall give his, change, his angels charge over me, and they will keep me in all my ways. They will bear thee up in their hands, lest they dash your stone against foot against the stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder. That's the serpents. That's the demonic powers. The young lion and the dragon, you will trample under your feet because, why? He has set his love upon me. Therefore God said, I will deliver Lane. I will set him on high because he knows my name. Lane shall call upon me and I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble and I will deliver him and I will honor him and with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. God is my protector. And not only is he my provider and my protector, but God is my director. What does it say in Psalms 3 and verse 5? Trust in the Lord. Put your faith in him. Take that first step with all of your heart. And this is what God will do. Do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. He will direct your path. God is my director. I love what the Apostle Paul said. He said, a Mars Hill, he was preaching. He said, listen, this is the eternal God. This is Yahweh. In him we live and move and dwell and have our very being. Just take that first step of faith. Obey him. Trust him. He is able to do what he says. God doesn't always show us the route. He doesn't always show us where we're going. If he did, some of you would never leave. Amen to that? So he shows us usually one step at a time, one day at a time. And that should satisfy us. This is what it means to walk by faith. The just shall walk by faith and not by sight. We can see why God chose Abraham to do this task. Abraham, he knew would take the first step when God told him to. And it reminds me so much of Peter. Remember, they were in the storm, and they were afraid that the ship was going to sink, and they looked out, and here comes Jesus, walking on top of the water in the midst of the storm. And what happens is, is when Jesus sees Peter walking on the water, his faith begins to explode and he says, Jesus, bid me come to you. And Jesus said to Peter, come. And Peter steps out of the boat in the middle of the storm and begins to take that first step. You remember that first step, what it must have been like for him? Like, is it going to happen? Am I, am I going to walk on the water or am I going to sink? He had to put his weight on the water. He had to put his weight on the water. That was a step of faith that he had to, God couldn't do that for him. Abraham had to take that first, or uh, what was his name? Peter. Peter had to take that first step of faith, right? He had to put his weight on the water. And when he did, the water held. And when he saw that, bam, he knew he could walk on the water. I, believe, I don't believe he was going like a surfer on the water. I believe he was like strutting on the water. He's like, yes, I can do this. And of course, we know what happened next, right? He took his eyes off of Jesus and he saw the big wave come in and he thought, oh boy. <laughs> and doubt filled him and he began to sink. But the fact is, is that Peter walked on the water and he could do it. Why? Because he saw Jesus conquering and because he heard Jesus calling. First of all, when he saw Jesus walk on the water, he knew that Jesus had already conquered the elements. He knew that Jesus had already, he was already doing it. He had already won it. He was already walking on the water. And when Peter saw Jesus conquering, he gave him faith to know that he would be able to conquer too. Because Jesus, number two, had called him and said, come, come on, Peter. 
Come, walk on the water with me. You and I can experience the same thing. We can walk in the supernatural when we get out of the boat and experience the miraculous. First of all, understanding that Jesus is calling us. Jesus said in Matthew 11 and 28, come unto me. Come unto me, all you weary and heavy laden. I will give you several scriptures, the spirit of the bride. Listen, the Bible ends with these words from Jesus on the throne who says, come. That who is thirsty, he who is thirsty, come. Let him who is hungry, come and drink of the water. He bids us in his last words, come. And he wants us to take that step and believe and we can do that because we know that Jesus has already conquered. Amen? Amen? Jesus in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, he says, I am the living one. I was dead and now alive. I am alive forevermore and I hold the keys to death, hell, and the grave. We saw Jesus come miraculously. We saw him live in the miraculous. We saw him die and we saw him miraculously raised from the dead. We saw him miraculously ascend under the heavens. We know that he has already conquered sin, death, hell, the grave. And because he lives he said we too shall live so we should live in confidence and boldness we can step out of that boat and do what God has called us to do because he's already gone before us he's already done it amen it's the first thing we can learn from Abram is obedience and it's not a blind obedience it's an obedience looking to Jesus who has already gone before us and said, because I do these, you too shall do them. The second thing is perspective. Abraham was able to do this because he had an eternal perspective to his life. Now, Abraham's faith detached him from the world. Pastor Nate was talking about it earlier, right? He trusted God's big picture. And this should be how all of us live. Rather than struggling and begging God for answers, we need to learn to trust in God's sovereignty. An eternal perspective means that we are living our lives now for something that's bigger and something that's better than we could ever imagine. Abram would never see ownership in the land of Canaan. But it really wasn't Canaan that he was after. It was the heavenly Beulah land. It was not a city named after him on this earth, but a city in heaven that was built for him by God. It says he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. He had that eternal perspective. His whole life, he could live in a tent without a piece of land, going from place to place because he knew that his whole time here on earth was just a part of something much bigger than he could see. Are you getting this? This is really important. The Apostle Paul shared his perspective in 2 Corinthians 4 and 18. When things are going very difficult, he said, when we are being persecuted and tormented and even dying for the faith, he says, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly, where it really is important, we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us a far, a far, get this, a far greater Far greater eternal glory that outweighs them all. So what do we do? So we fix our eyes, our gaze, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. If you can see it, it's temporary. But what we can't see is eternal. I don't believe Abram was ever disappointed that he ever got to see the fulfillment of God's promise here on the earth before he died because he knew that what God said he was going to do and Abraham also knew this about God 
He understood this about God, that there was only one God, that Yahweh was the living God, the one and only true God the creator God who held this world together and who controlled everything. Abram was looking for a better city, a better country. And this is how we should live our lives. When Linda and I were first married, we lived in Minot, North Dakota, which is way up 45 miles from the Canadian border. It's like way up one of the coldest places in America. Long ways. I grew up in Florida, okay? So this is like a huge stretch for me. When I said to God, I will go, he said, you're going to North Dakota. I said, ah. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know what to think. I'd never been to North Dakota. But when I got my eyes on this sunflower here, suddenly I love North Dakota. I love me some North Dakota, right? <laughs> because of what God had for me in North Dakota. But anyway, we were first married. So my North Dakota is called the Magic City. And it really is one of our favorite places we ever lived. It was a, a, a beautiful small city uh, in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's like 50, 60 miles from any city. Sometimes maybe even further than that from any city of any size. Way out there in the middle of nowhere. And here's this city. And it sets in what's called, they call it a coulee. Like there's a riverbed with trees and everything. It's like, it's like you're in this prairie desert and then there's this river and there's just all these trees and it's like a little Garden of Eden, right? <clears throat> so it's down in a coulee and around it are the prairie, the big hills. So at nighttime, I'll always remember at nighttime, we would be driving. I was the state youth director, we did a lot of driving. So uh, often we would come Sunday night on the way back home. And I remember we get to Velva, North Dakota, which is a little tiny town outside of Minot, about 10, 15 miles. And you come over this hill, and you come up the top of the hill at Velva, and all of a sudden you look out, and this is what you see. This is a picture. It's the picture up there. Yeah. That's Minot, Magic City, right? And it's like... There's a blackness, there's darkness, there's no houses, there's no towns, there's nothing. It's the total blackness. You come over the hill, it's like, boom, here's this beautiful city and all its light. Remember that, Linda? Yeah, it was like, there's mine. I just, I still see that in my mind. And it gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling because I thought, you know what? Ah, we're almost home. We're almost home. I can see the lights from the city. We're almost home. So let me ask you today, where is your home? And you know, I, I enjoyed being in Minot, but Minot was never my home. And from Minot, North Dakota, we moved to Cleveland, Tennessee. And I love living in Cleveland, Tennessee, but Cleveland, even though I was born there, was not my home. And from there, we moved to Montana, and Montana is nobody's home. Even the people who live there, right? They're like, I, you need to leave now. Uh, <laughs> and from Montana, we moved to, to North Dakota. From North Dakota, you know, we moved uh, to Tennessee. Tennessee, we moved to uh, Wisconsin, right? And a, huh? No, oh, no, we moved to Kentucky. We moved to Lexington, Kentucky. And then from Lexington, Kentucky, I love living in Lexington, but it wasn't my home. And then God said, no, I'm going to move you. And we moved to Wisconsin. And I love living in Wisconsin. I was there for almost eight years. And was, that was, but, but you know what? It wasn't my home. God says, no, I'm going to move you. I'm going to move you to North Carolina. And so we moved to North Carolina. We love living in North Carolina. We built a house there. Okay, this is going to be our forever place. And then God says, no, nope, I'm going to move you. Where are you going to move from me now, God? I'm going to move you to New England. England to Connecticut. I said, is that in the United States? Because I like the United States. Great place to live. I said, yes, it's sort of in the United States. There's a lot of patriots there, but it's different than any place you've ever lived before. Every place is different than you've ever lived before. 
And I moved here, and I've been here 11 years. I'm like, I love, I love living here. I love doing life with you here. But you know what? This is not my home. One day, God is going to take me home. One day, the trumpet's going to sound. And the dead in Christ are going to rise. And those of us who are alive and remain, we're going to be cut up to be with the Lord in the air. And so shall we forever be with the Lord. I'm telling you, home is not a place, it's a person. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I'm with Jesus, I'm home. When I'm with Jesus, wherever I am is home because he is my home. He's my, not my home, he's my home. He's my dwelling place, amen? Jesus is my all in all. Life comes from him. He's the very breath that I breathe. He's the very reason that I exist. He is the reason why I have a future. He is my future. Everything. Everything in this world is going to burn with fire, but everything that is eternal will last forever. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, but where thieves break in and steal, but rather store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. He says, this is why. Because where your heart is, where your treasure is, those two are connected. And where you put your treasure is where your heart's going to be. And where your heart's going to be is where you're going to be. So is your treasure on earthly things? Or is your treasure in heavenly things? Now, don't get me wrong. Listen, there's absolutely nothing wrong with buying nice things and having expensive things and enjoying good things in life. Just make sure they're not your heart. Make sure that you do not worship those things or give attention or desire toward those things because they're going to burn. There is only one place that we are to set our affections, our heart. Colossians 3 and 2 says this, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. Enjoy the world, but don't love this world or the things that are in the world. John wrote in 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world, neither the things that are in the world. Any man whose love, your heart, your desires, your passion is for the world and the things of the world, guess what? The love of the Father is not in him. Pretty strong words, right? John also said in his gospel, chapter 15, Jesus said, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. So don't get too comfortable, my friends. Jesus is coming back soon. And we're out of here. But I really want to close out the sermon with this. If you really have an eternal perspective, if you're really living for God and for eternal things, and not for earthly corruptible things. If we really can get that mindset, let me tell you what, it brings you a peace and a confidence in life. Because you understand that no matter what happens to you in this life, God is in control of it. This is so important because some of you live in fear with so many questions about the future. Will things get worse? Will I lose my health? Will I get cancer? Will I lose my hair? <laughs> Will there be another pandemic? Will there be a World War III? Will my children disappoint me? Will I be ridiculed by my faith, for my faith? Will, will my dreams come to pass? Will I die prematurely? I just want to remind you this morning with confidence to know that God is in control. He is working his plan for all of us in his perfect timing. Abraham trusted this. He said, God promised me this land to my descendants. It's going to be, 
It's going to be mine. I may not see it now. I may not feel it now. I may not have it, but God said it. And whatever happens in my life, it doesn't matter because what God declared is going to come to pass. I just trust God, period. Scripture says, Ephesians 1.11, that God predestined us according to the purpose of his, of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will. That says that God is at work every single day accomplishing and working things out for his design and his plan that he predestined for us. Isn't that powerful? I like the way the Message Bible says this verse. Ephesians 1.11, let me read it to you. It is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us and had designs for us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and in everyone. I love that. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful this morning that the one and only true and living God rules sovereignly over this world and everybody in it. And that means that no matter how evil or how powerful some men or some women may become, God still rules over them and all of their wicked deeds are only playing into his sovereign plan. Listen, this is not just confident thinking. This is, this is, this is not, uh, this is what God's word has declared. Every morning, you and I should get up with confidence knowing that, listen, God has made this day and God has made me, and God has made me for this day, and he's got a divine design and a plan. So Holy Spirit, what do you want to do today? What are you, where are you going to send me today? Who are you going to send into my path today? And who are you sending me into their path today? Every moment of this day is met by divine design. The good things that happen and the bad things that happen. God is working all things together with his purpose according to his sovereign plan and will in my life. There's confidence in that. There's boldness in that. Amen? You say, well, yeah, what about the trouble? Jesus said in John 16 and verse 33, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good courage, I have overcome the world. Here's Lane's translation. You're going to have trouble, but just stay with me. Just stay with me. Just follow me. Just stay with me because I will show you the way out of trouble. Amen? Amen. Worship team, if you'll come, the musician, whoever's coming today. If the ushers are prepared, we're going to partake of communion together this morning. Before we want to do it, we do, I just want to pray with you. Father, there's people listening online, there's people right here this morning who are having a hard time with faith, having a hard time trusting you. And the reason why they're having a hard time is because they're looking at their circumstances. They're looking at things that they see. They're looking at temporal things. By faith, they need to learn to look at the things that are not seen, which are the promises that you have given. And Father, you want them not to live their life in a stormy boat. You want them to walk on top of the water. You want them to walk on top of the storm. You want them to walk in the supernatural. And the only way they're going to get there is by faith. They're going to have to take that first step like Abraham did, like Peter did. They're going to have to go. A faith that goes, that obeys, that has an eternal perspective that says, I'm going to step into this water because Jesus told me to. And if I sink, then I sink. And Jesus wanted me to sink. If I walk on the water, I walk, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to obey him. And know that he is sovereign. And if he tells me I can walk on the water, I'm going to trust him and I'm going to walk on the water. But Lord, I pray that you would use this word today and use Abraham's example today. 
to build up their faith to believe you. And I pray especially for those right now who are struggling with faith in God because they're wanting to live their life by reason and not by faith. They're wanting to, to live their life by what they can prove. And I pray that you would show them today that the way to find you to be real is by taking that first step, that leap of faith that says, I'm going to believe and I'm going to trust God in my life. And when we do that, that you then will show us that you are alive, that you are real. And I pray for them today that they would surrender their hearts to you and say, okay, God, I'm going to test you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to see. That's all you want, God. You want us to take that first step. You've already taken the first step. You came to the earth. You died on a cross for us. You made a way for us to have eternal life. Now, Lord, they need to take that next step, and I pray for them. If the, if the ushers would come and prepare your stations today. In Jesus' name, I pray. Now, you'll notice at the communion table, there's some words written in the front of the table. It says, <coughs> this do in remembrance of me. And usually when we partake of communion... When we come to this table, <clears throat> we are remembering Jesus' death. The grape juice that represents the body of the blood of Jesus and the, the bread that represents the blood of the body of Jesus. And we remember the price that he paid for us. The great price where he died for us to have eternal life. We remember this. But this morning, I want you to have a different perspective. I want you to take that eternal dimension perspective. And I want you to remember not just the death of Christ, but what his death represents for us. We need to remember that Jesus overcame death. We need to remember that Jesus overcame the grave. Today, we need to remember that Jesus is the conquering king. Today, we need to remember that Jesus made a way for me. Today, we, re we need to remember that Jesus is alive and making intercession for me. And because he lives, I too shall live. Today, we remember and we take confidence and boldness because we see that Jesus has conquered already. Stand with me if you would. Everybody that's here, if you're a child of God, if you're a member of the family of God, you're welcome to join us in communion. You don't have to be a member of this church. And if those of you are watching online, you wanna, you've prepared your elements. We have communion the last Sunday of every month. I want you to be prepared if you can't be here. But I will lead you in just a minute. Gather your grape juice and your crackers, your bread, and we'll partake together online. But for those of you in the room who want to give you instructions, those of you in this section, if you will come to your left and receive from this station and go back to your chairs that way, if you'll come at this time. This section, if you'll come to your left, I'm sorry, if you'll come to your left, I'm missing one. If you'll come to your left also from this station, so all of you in this section will be coming to your left here. This middle section here, if you'll come to your left and partake from this section here. If you partake from this section right here, thank you. This section here, if you will come to your left and partake from this middle section right here. This section, if you'll come to your left and partake from this section right here. This section here, if you'll partake from right here. Okay, come to your left. Those in the back, you get to choose. This section, if you'll come to your left, please, and receive the elements from this station. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. We remember. <clears throat> we remember.
just hold the elements and bring them back to your chairs. When everybody has been served, we'll all partake together at the same time. Those of you online, just, just be prepared. We'll all partake together today. the elements. Thank you. Will you raise the bread of our Lord? 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul gives instructions for this meal. <clears throat> it says that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. Saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Father, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus for putting robe of flesh and blood upon him, to took on the form of a man so that he could pay the price for men, for men's sins, for our flesh that was cursed. You took the curse upon you who knew no sin, who became sin for us. And we remember that body that was broken today. You were broken so that we could be put back together. We bless this, your body, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may partake. Thank you. Let's raise the cup. And after supper, he took the cup, and he blessed it, saying, This is my blood, which is shed for they didn't know what Jesus was about to do, but Jesus knew exactly what he was about to do. He was about to spill his blood, which was a holy blood, an atoning blood that would cover the sins of the whole world. Jesus, I thank you so much for your obedience and your faith and your trust in the Father. Even though you said in the garden, I would that this cup would pass from me. You knew that cup was a cup of suffering. It's a cup of death. But Jesus, you said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. 
So Jesus, we thank you that your will was accomplished on the cross and your blood was shed for us. And I thank you for the forgiveness that you offer us from all sin. We bless this, your cup, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may partake. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now let's just take a moment just thank him. Just thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your work on Calvary for us. And I thank you as we remember today not only your death but your life. You rose from the dead victorious. Because you are victorious, we walk in victory today. And we don't have to fear the future. We don't have to fear anything. We just have to get out of the boat. We just have to take the first step. We just have to be like Abram and go. We have to load the truck, and where you lead us, we'll follow. So let us go from this building, not just today, but every day with a boldness and confidence, knowing that you have a plan, and your plan will come to pass. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Love one another. Please join us downstairs for donuts and coffee, and let's fellowship together. God bless you. Thank you for watching today. Love one another.